Let me just tell you a couple of things. What, what CCM is all about is all about giving you the word so that you may practice the word in your relationship with God. It's not about making you feel bad so you want to run to Jesus and repent. You know, I believe all of us should always be soft and gentle every morning with God so that he can refresh us and renew us. You know, this is a fallen planet. How many here know that it's a fallen planet? And whether you know it or not, there's a thing called mystery, the mystery of iniquity. And you might not know this, but I'm going to just kind of enlighten you a little bit. It's like a darkened cloud that kind of hangs over the planet. You can't really see it because we were raised in it. But it affects every human being, every animal, plants. It's called the curse. Okay? Now, when the law came, the law came to show us the curse and to show that mankind cannot save themselves. And so for the Jew, the law was a wonderful commandment to tell the Jewish people, look, you brought forth a Messiah, but just because you're going to bring forth a Messiah doesn't grandfather you in. You still have to be born again. And so the Jewish people, they began to know and understand God. But, you know, we have an enemy that keeps us away from us having a deeper relationship with God. And this church is all designed about helping you become closer to God. Can you say amen? All right. Well, good morning to you. Good to see my brother I haven't seen in years. And good to see a lot of you, those of you coming in on TV. Hi, family. Hi, those in Ohio and New York. And some of you in Florida. I'm so glad this little teeny church has touched a lot of lives, and we're so glad. I want to share with you something, and so this is going to be a short, so what we're doing is short clips, so I want to share you sort of a sermon before the sermon, okay? We want to talk about, but for those of you coming in, I want to talk about forgiveness. The Bible says that when we stand praying, we are to forgive, unless there's somebody's committed a crime against, we're to forgive them. How many can say Amen. But there are those people that it seem really, really hard to forgive. For some reason or not, they're, they're just there. Let me just share something about forgiveness. All you really have to do to forgive someone is say, Father, I forgive them. And you can mention their name. This is with you and, and God in prayer. And I ask you to forgive me, and I forgive them, and set them free, Lord. And then place them in God's hands and let God have them. Now, whenever a thought or a negativity or somebody mentions that name and you feel those feelings back, that's not unforgiveness. That's the enemy trying to get you to be unforgiving again. So take that. Be free. Thoughts die unborn when they're not spoken. All right. Let's get into our last. series called Reigning in Life in Christ. How many know God wants us to reign in life? Can you say amen? We're not supposed to be under the weather, under the circumstances. All right, so I want to go ahead and we have our scripture that we're going to bring up. We're going to call this, for you taking notes, How to Pray for the Lost. How to Pray for the Lost. Now, I don't know about you, but I have relatives that are not saved yet. Now, I was wonderfully blessed by leading my mother and father to Jesus. 
My parents were raised. My mom had a Methodist background, but she didn't take. <laughs> she married my father, which was the king of uh, miners, and, and he was king of the hill because he ran a, um, a group of miners that worked under him. What is that called? A supervisor? Yeah, yeah. Well, he called himself the king of the hill, and so when new people would come to join their working force, he says, now, if any of you have a problem with me, I want you to step up right now, and then he'd whip them and beat them up really good, then buy them lunch and a drink afterwards. Now, we're talking unsaved people, okay, and my dad. So my dad, my mom married my dad. Can you see the combination? And you know, all right. But you know what? God had a wonderful plan for every human being, and that's why you and I come in. Our job is to share Christ with everyone. Share Christ with everyone. Well, I can't share Christ. My life's been a wreck. See, that's the whole thing. You've been focusing on your life instead of God who straightens out our life. Take that to heart, okay? All right, so I, I just got saved. See, one day I got saved. So I went home, told my, my mom and dad what happened to me. Well, my mom said, well, uh, that's good, honey. And then my dad says, well, at least now I can believe you when you tell me stuff. That was how they responded. But through a short time and through singing Christmas songs, my mom and dad came up and both my dad and my mom came and enjoyed the presence of God. My mom's a little skeptic. My dad got wonderfully saved. So I led after a year's of time, about a year and a half, I led my mom, finally came to the Lord. And both of my parents were very supportive to me, so I'm very thankful for them. So everybody needs Jesus. Can you say amen? They don't need the religious Jesus that you hear. God is not religious. He doesn't want you to be religious. Religion is simply repeating something religiously. Now, he wants you to be personal, have a relationship with him. Can you say amen? And it wasn't for years. Once my dad got saved, he worked with me. I mean, we had a successful, he was my administrator. But I never got to know my dad really close until later on in our life. It takes time to get to really know someone, doesn't it? And you know, it's just that way with God. Don't, don't, don't write God off or whether you feel good or not, whether you feel saved or not. Let him have his way in your life. You'll not be disappointed. Are you ready? Let's get into this. I'm going to read my paragraph to you. So greetings to you this morning. And God has really come and sent his son to bring about change in our life. Today we're going to uh, learn how to pray for the lost. You might have people in your family that are not saved. Brothers, sisters, children. You might have a cousin and aunt. Maybe somebody needs to be rededicated rededicated to the Lord. Maybe they went to a, a nice church or something, but they never really made a great decision for God. Our job is to encourage them, to help them want to have Jesus. But you, when you do that, you're going to have to guide them and let them know that you're sharing Jesus with them is not trying to get them to be religious. You're trying to get them to know their creator. And so we have to learn to talk different as Christians, to not just say what everybody's saying, not use cliches and Christianities. What our job is to reach the heart of people and be able to draw them into the relationship that God really wants them to have with them. Now, folks, we're in the age of grace. The age of grace says that God is not mad at us. He wants everyone to come through his son, Jesus, so he can save the remnant of his family. We were stolen away from God in Adam so many thousands of years ago. And all of our genes and all of our life, our bodies cursed because of Adam's sin. Now God wants us to be with him so he can restore what the canker worm, what the evil of this planet has stolen from you. We're to love not the world nor the things of the world. For the love of the world is full of dis corruption and destruction. Well, what are we to love? Love the earth. It's different. Everyone say the earth is one thing, the world is another. You might think they're the same. The earth and the fullness thereof belongs to God. 
but the world system belongs to Satan. That's why everything you do is broken. Everything you see seems to be broken because he's running that system and he's a real broken dude. Hello? So we don't want to listen to anything. We don't want to be caught up in what he's doing, but we do want to learn how to pray for the lost. Can you say amen? Now, let me see the hands. Have you got somebody in your family who still needs to be saved? Wave your hands at me. See, all of you do. So we need to really learn what we're going to learn today. Can you say amen? So we're going to show you how to get their angels working. We're going to show you how to bind up the evil spirits in their life, remove their assignments. Are you ready to take notes and learn? Good. Again, what we're about here is to give you what you need to get people in your family saved, to get your life up in order, and God's right there to help you every step of the way. Say amen. Now, we're going to cover these four things, and then we'll read our paragraph. We're going to cover these four areas. God desires for us to ask, seek, and knock. Say amen. Because if we don't ask, we don't get. If we don't seek, we don't find. And if we don't knock, no doors that God has for us will open. So you have to do, you have to be in back, active in your faith to seek, ask, and knock. Say amen. Second thing, we're going to cover praying for all mankind. I had a lady say to me, now she's an elder in a wonderful church. She said to me a long time ago when I was training her, she says, are we supposed to pray for everybody? I said, what do you think? Yes. All right. So especially those that are close to your heart. God didn't save you for no reason. He saved you, wants you to serve him so he can reach your family, so he can reach your sisters, your brothers, maybe your children, your grandchildren. And like me and you, some of them great-grandchildren. Say amen. I think we have a great-great back there somewhere. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, when you pray for these, did you know when you pray for people, take their name, place them on the altar. Now, listen, do it once. Keep them on the altar and don't take them off. How do I take them off? By talking about them. See, I pray for you, Sherry, and I say, Father, I, I take my sister Sherry and I place her on your altar. I ask you to work out her salvation and Lord, begin to give her and work in her all the things she doesn't know to ask you. Go in, show her things she needs to know and help order her steps aright. Now, see, if I pray for all of you that way, I don't leave any room for the enemy to come on in. And so we've learned a lot of great things. For example, we've learned that when we pray, we're whisked up in front of God in his throne room, aren't we? So is the devil there? Here's another thing. This is for my new brother I haven't seen for a while. Satan can't hear your prayers when you pray in Jesus' name. You go, Father, in Jesus' name, immediately he's blinded and you are whisked up before God. Now, there's no devil in heaven. <laughs> Can you say amen? They're all down here on the earth. Every evil force that rebelled against God, God imprisoned them on this earth, on this planet. Hello? Take a look at the trouble here. And see, because maybe, maybe you need to know, maybe you don't need to know, Jesus, is a, his authority is in heaven, earth, and under the earth. So Satan's camped out in the atmosphere we breathe. Somehow he's cloaked himself, <laughs> and, and he's in the earth working with all the bimbos that are listening to him. Don't get mad at me if I use the word bimbo. Okay, and then, and then fourthly, he's under the earth. Right now our military are discovering all kinds of underground caverns and things where they're finding ruins. I can tell you of a city named Darren Kuyu. Everyone say Darren Kuyu. It's in India, and it houses 20,000 people underground. It was hidden for years. Who made that and all that? Because of the enemy, he came down, he wanted this planet, and he's trying to keep it still. That's why he's messing with God's kids. Everyone say, he's not messing with me. In Jesus' name, say it again. He's not messing with me. In Jesus' name. You got to make a stand. Because if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for everything. Because he's a tremendous con artist. That's all he has now is conning. And people don't need to have a weak mental 
facility. They need to be strong and sober. Can you say amen? Thirdly, we're going to cover prayer, inviting God into someone else's life. And then fourthly, we're going to cover prayer, believe, and then keep them in God's hands. So we're talking about the lost. So we're going to really going to show you how to get someone saved. We're going to deal with prayer. Did, did I go too fast for you? And we're going to start with prayer. I'll go over them again and show you how to pray for them. And then when you get the chance to share your faith, I'll show you how to witness to them. Okay? And listen, again, every known religion of man, every known religion of man, all is man's effort to try to reach God. Only Jesus came to reach us. That's why it's the only truth, the only way, the only life. Because God did not honor man in their sinful state trying to reach him, but he answered and sent his son, and he said, you receive him, I'll receive you. See, our father says, you receive my son, which takes humility, takes brokenness and humility to receive Jesus in our life. And he says, then I'll receive you, and I'll be a father to you, and I'll take good care of you. How many here have experienced the great care of our Father? Wonderful, isn't it? Let's turn around and read our scripture. All right. It's quite long, so I'm going to go quick, not stopping. Then he spoke a parable, a story cast down to show a point, that men ought always to pray and not to give up, lose heart saying there was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard men. Next. Yet because the widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, there's a point right there, okay? Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith? on the earth. Do you believe for God? Really, this term faith means, will he find his children believing that he exists? All God in this time that we live, it's called the church age, the age of grace, all God needs is a human being to cry out to him, and God will save him. As many call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be what? Saved. Now, what happens after a person is saved? God puts a seal puts his life in him, and then they need to get to a place where they could be trained and taught. And oftentimes, sometimes, they don't. So when you lead somebody to the Lord, get their number, find out, bring them into church, say amen. And if they start to go back in their old habits, keep after them. Remember how much it was to convince you how much God lived, loved you, remember? And some of you were easy wins, and some of you were like me and were stubborn and finally came to the Lord. Amen. Well, we know coming to the Lord is the only escape that we have with God out of this planet. Nobody leaves this planet, not even the devil, without accepting Jesus, and Satan can't. He's already judged. So he's captured in a prison here. Hello? The earth is a prison. Now, I'm going to say something else because some of you like the Star Wars and all this kind of stuff, and I, I read the Bible and study a lot. But there's no aliens coming from outer space, the, the earth. I'm sorry. And if there was, God would tell them to go away. This is an evil planet. It's got an evil person in it, and he doesn't want people stuck with the evilness that we got. Hello? That's logical sense. But not only that, but NASA says, NASA says that there's, and SETI, there's nothing coming from out there into here. Something's already here coming into our area. 
That's biblical, you know. God put Satan behind a curtain, all his demons and everything behind a curtain. It's only the human being that can pull them out through tarot cards and all that witchcraft, and that's what they did. So there's a few spooks running around, and the, and the devil's running around, but the majority of them are behind a curtain, unable to come into where you and I are. Aren't you glad? Because some of them are so wicked, you would die right where you're at looking at them. See, that's what's been hidden from us. That's what religion was designed to do, to hide you and give you a little sweet little check, 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 walk with the Lord. It's a little more than that. We're in a war, folks. And therefore, the people out there, they're still lost. You see, if you're still fighting for your life and your choices, it'll be all right. God will help you with those. But see, you already have Jesus in your heart. If you received Jesus when you were a little kid, he's never left you. You just covered him up with you. Now, unbury him and get him out there so he can help our lives. Say amen. amen. Man, God loves us. And listen, people will say to me a lot, aren't you afraid of the devil, Pastor Kerry? No, I am not. He's defeated. But see, Satan plays the religious game. And what happens is you, you try to believe God, and so he resists you. So you think believing God's hard and all this. No, it's all a deception, folks. How hard was it for Jesus to come into your heart? Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. There wasn't a devil in hell that kept that from you. Now, why do we think the devil is so tough? I tell you, because we've been mistaught. Someone say, oh, me. So we're going to cover these four areas again, just in case you missed the notes. God desires for us, ask, seek, and knock. Two, praying for all mankind, not just one or two. Three, pray. prayer is inviting God into people's lives. And then fourth, pray, believe, and keep the people you pray for, the lost, in God's hands. Can you say amen? Now, Sherry... I hope, hope they capture me with the camera. Here you go. I give you this. Take so-and-so. Come on, take him. Give it up. Ah, that's what God says. Give it up. When we give it. <laughs> I love it. When you give things up, God can take them and, and sanctify them, make them good. Do you understand? But when you hold on and you're like that, you're just being a tard. We don't want that. We want you to get everything God has. Come on. People either like me, they hate me. But I tell you what, you're going to get the, the straight stuff here. And not only that, we're going to pray for you and build you up. So guess what? The only way, reason you owe Paul is because you chose to. Now, come on. Look up. Say, God loves me. God's forgiven me. Amen. You know, and if you can't say that, then you need a deliverance. And I, I love casting out devils. Amen. Especially when they scream and they go back to the devil and go, dee, 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 dee. Amen. Probably a hundred in my life. You know, and so I don't like them. I don't want them around. And you don't shouldn't like them either. They stink. They smelly. They make you feel bad. And then they jump on you and make you feel condemned. Listen, if you feel any condemnation here, that's the enemy telling you that. Right here, this is the most loving church you could ever go to. And people forgive easily here. They don't hold on against anybody. All right, so you ready? God desires for us to ask, seek, and knock. Go with me to John 16, please. In verse um, 23. And in that day, the day that Jesus rose from the day, the day that Pentecost came, the day that church age was born, and the church was born, Pentecost. In that day, you will ask nothing in my name. Most assuredly, I say, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that shall he give it to you. In the new covenant, we address the Father. In the disciples addressed Jesus one-on-one -on -one because he was with them. Now Jesus is with the Father, and he says, Now, in this day, address your heavenly Father in my name. When you do that, the God of everything 
will favor you. But you'll see people today, oh Lord, we pray in your name. And God goes, what is the name I told you to pray in? Jesus, higher than any name that would ever be named in heaven and earth and under the earth. God says use that name because Satan hates it. It destroys his kingdom every time you use it. Now, how many here feel like punching the devil? Everyone say, Jesus. Jesus. You just did. Punch him again. Jesus. But bring it out of your gut where your spirit man is. Stop being a wimp. Amen. <laughs> I sure love you. You guys are wonderful. Let's get on with this now. So you can see, address my father in my name, and he will give it to you. Verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask now, and you will receive that your joy may be full. God wants us happy, full of joyous and life, telling others what God is doing in us. Then it goes on, verse 26, and in that day you will ask my in my name, and and I do not say that you, that you should pray to the Father for you. In other words, he's saying, you guys are used to priesthood, going to somebody, then that somebody goes to God. Now he says, in that day, in this day we're talking about, I'm not going to go to the Father for you. You're going to go to the Father in me. See the difference? You're going to come to the Father on your own. I'm not going to carry you necessarily there. So good for us to have that understanding. And you know, because he did that, he goes, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have received that I have come from God. So remember in the Old Testament, they didn't know a loving father. Philip said, he was a disciple, he was a Jewish man. Philip said, he says, show us the Father. You talk about the Father all the time, Jesus. You're always talking about the Father. We don't know the Father. We just know God. And Jesus said to Philip, Philip, have you seen me? How long have I been with you? Have you guys been with me for a little while? Do you know me? Yeah. If somebody lies about me, you can pick up on. Now, those that don't know me, that's a different story. But you see, it's that way. So he said to Philip, he said, Philip, You've been watching me, living with me, eating with me, doing this well, all the rest of the gang. You've seen me. I look and act just like my father. Someone says, well, what does the Holy Spirit look like? Just like the father. And what does Jesus look like? Just like the father. And what does the father look like? Just like the father. Now, you know, I'm kind of hamming it up with you. They all look like triplets. But, but I don't know how to explain it because, because there's the Father God, there's the Word that became flesh, the Jesus, and there's the Holy Spirit. All three are one in unity, but they operate in different categories. The Father is above all, through all, and in us all. And Jesus is the one that interacts with us, brings us to the Father. And the Holy Spirit now is the only one on the earth that brings us everything from God. That's why it says that all manner of sin is forgiven except for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What he was saying, again, I take mysteries out of stuff. He says, if you will never receive Jesus in your heart, then there's no hope for you. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. To blaspheme means to repel the Holy Spirit and what he wants to give you. Holy Spirit's the delivery system that God set up in the earth, a God himself, to deliver everything from the hand of the Father. And if you won't receive his gifts and his spirit and his moving, then you're blaspheming, you're repelling God. And you can seriously repel God to the very moment you die and go right off to hell. And we don't want anyone going there, can you say amen, except for the devil and his, his cohorts. So therefore, for a child of God to never have Jesus in their heart is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Say, thank you. I never knew that before. Because everybody makes it into way more than it is. I know people's, and, and I have, when I was away from God, and I went to God's people, and they all rejected me. I, I'm supposed to go to God's people, and they're supposed to restore a fallen minister. I had to go to California to do that. Hello, 
God wants his people restored. He doesn't want them broken all the time. So here's what we believe. I believe that a minister has problems. They all fail. You fail. Our job is, instead of picking on your failings, is to help you pick things up with God and get on. Can you say amen? God restores. He doesn't condemn. And so when I fell, everybody didn't want anything to do with me except for five people. And I said, what is going on? And he said, physician, heal yourself. He was going to say, well, people, a lot of people's minds and eyes and ideas of ministry sometimes are not really getting them to God. It's just sort of building their own kingdom. And so I want to let you know, I'm not here to build a kingdom. I'm not here to make myself anything special. I'm here to make you special. I'm here to build you up. I'm here to give you what you need. And if you don't want me to do that, find somebody that will do it for you. But I don't want to see you dropping off somewhere where you don't belong. Can you say amen? I get attached to people. And it's, I stay attached. I don't have one person I hate. And I have a lot of people that just don't like me. But you know what? At one time they were my friends. And today, still today they're my friends. Because friendship in God never turns on somebody. Say amen. Will Jesus turn on you? I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. You see, he's not going to ever turn on you. But he wants you to come to him about everything. Everything. And bury your heart to him so he can get that out of you. It's going to take a little while to get the world out of us. Come on. But he'll do it with us. Thank God you don't have to do it. (laughs) Here's the thing. You can't do a thing by yourself. Really understand that. You can't even complain by yourself. You can't talk. You can't think. You have never come up with an original idea on your own. You either borrowed it, somebody told you, the devil slipped it in on you, or God gave it to you, but you never originated anything. That was taken from us in Adam. Now, with God in us, we can be creative, and we can have life, and we can influence people. Glory to God. We'll sit around there like a bump on the log. Get up and live. (laughs) Come on. Get up and live. All right, let's move on to my next point. Amen. So Matthew 7, go with me there. Matthew still on the same point. God desires to ask, seek, and knock. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. He's talking about spiritual things. He's not talking about evil. Satan is the God of this world had blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let me reiterate it in the Greek. Have blinded the ones that have a lot of doubt. If you're doubting God all the time, you're going to be blind as a bat. Spiritually. And we don't want that. We want you to be alert. And your alertness and your your keenness to God comes in your prayer life first thing every day. Get in, plug in, get tuned up, get tuned in, get yourself going, get yourself clothed, and move out in your day as a conqueror. Now, most Christians don't do that. And you know what? Some of them have been saved 60 years. Who hasn't told them the truth? Who's held the very precious truths from them? Well, they're going to, whoever did it, who didn't share the truth when they needed to share it, is going to have to answer for all of that. I want to be guilty of giving you what you need as the word so you can take it, practice it before God, and he and God and both of you work together and become conquerors like he told you you would be. Say amen. Look at, that, look at hard situations. Here's another thing. Thank you, Lord. Look at hard situations you face as a challenge for God to make you an overcomer. Instead of looking at it, oh, no, what are we going to do? See, you're, you're earthly bound. You're, you're bound by earthly things. 
Lift up your head and say, Lord, what are we going to do? I need some help. See? And God says, great, I'm glad you asked me. Because you have not, because you asked not. Now that you asked me, I'm involved. Say amen. And remember, every day, get God involved. Because some of us have a lifestyle that shuts God out in the day. Hello? You get up, you're doing your own thing, and God says, Carrie, yeah. Um, how come you, you spent two or three hours, didn't even say hi? We forget God's our friend, right? He sent his son down here to die for us. Why do we treat him like we're only going to talk to him when we need him? I talk to him throughout the day. You think I was nuts you saw me in the store. Hey, God, what do you think? Which one's the better product? I know this one's 10 cents cheaper. Oh, thank you, Lord. I, I intermingle, and I want you to intermingle your conversations with God. Forget about your flesh. Remember, this, what you see, what you see in the mirror, it's not the real you. This is a product of Adam's sin. It stinks. You have to bathe it. You have to, you know, do whatever it takes to pre make it presentable. Come on now. That, that's all we need to do with our body. Present it before the Lord, it says. A living sacrifice. Amen. But if you let your body on your moods and feelings guide you around, you're going to be very broken all the time. We don't want you broken. God came to fix you. Let him fix you. Man, I tell you what, getting people to church, I got all these problems. I know this situation, my kids, what am I going to do? When's the last time you were at church? Well, I, when's the last time you really spent time with God? Um, oh, God loves me. Yes, he does. But it's not going to help you at all because you're not asking him to. You cannot get God to trespass you if you're so caught up in yourself and what you're doing. If you don't ask him to get involved, he'll let you just do your thing. He'll, he'll want you to be involved because he can see 360 way out ahead, way behind, everywhere at once. I want that kind of guidance system. Can you say amen? And you all have it. For everyone that asks receives he who seeks finds, he who knocks is open. Or what man, and this is the word blasphemy, we're going to get at this. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, would he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would he give him a serpent? If he asked for anything, hello? And then he says something real strange. I want you to get it. And he's talking to his disciples, and he says, you being evil, you can give good gifts to your children. He just called his disciples evil. What are you going to do with that? The reason why he called them evil is because they hadn't been born again yet. They had an evil nature. Had to change. You still have an evil nature. If you don't crucify your flesh every day, it will rise up and make you embarrassed. You might not think you're embarrassed until you're really embarrassed. <laughs> hey, son, you forgot your pants when he went out. <laughs> you know? Get it together. And so God's here to help us get it together. Now, the whole idea behind this is he's just waiting to answer our prayer, Becky. Give you a new room. Take care of you. Amen. So we need to focus and love him. Say, I, say I got it. All right, point two, praying for all mankind. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Praying for all mankind. So God wants everybody saved, but is everybody going to get saved? God wants everybody healed. Is everybody going to get healed? Of course not. So, but if we don't go out there and share the message, how are they going to hear? Nobody tells them. Amen. So we, we need to go, every one of us. Our first and foremost job is to be with God. Second is to love others by sharing Christ with them. The reason why a lot of Christians have problems is they're too busy trying to get their needs met all the time and get things together, and they forgot to go out and touch other people's life for Jesus. 
Well, I can't touch anybody else's life with Jesus. My life's just a wreck. See, that's what you think. God says to take your eyes off yourself. He'll fix your wreck. You go tell someone how good God is. In sowing, you'll reap. In sowing, you'll reap. In sowing, you'll reap. In sowing, you'll reap. Stop sowing and you won't reap. Stop sowing and you won't reap. So get busy. Sow some good stuff. Talk with God. And yawn for the glory of the Lord. <laughs> that was great. Perfect timing on that. All right, so therefore... I exhort you, here's Paul writing to Timothy, first of all, with all your people, all the people you're pastoring, Timothy, first of all, all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for how many men? All men. For kings, for all those in authority, that we may lead a peaceable and quiet life in all goodness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires that all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator, Jesus, between God and man, the man Christ, Jesus. All right. God wants everybody saved, right? So do you have relatives? And I'm not asking you to respond to me. I know you have relatives that you're not sure if they're saved. So pay close attention. Get ready to take notes. Let me show you how to do this. First of all, God showed me some time ago that we have so much authority and so much power, he's just waiting for us to ask him to get involved. So I'm sitting, you got to see the humor in this. I'm sitting in a hot tub at Bally's um, Physical Health Club. Back then it was called Bally's. There's a whole bunch of them now. And where we worked out and we did all that. And then you went and you swam in the pool. And then you got in the hot sauna and you get into the... So I'm sitting there thinking of all these people coming and going about their lives and who they are and who they're not. And God said to me, he says, do you want to see a few of them get saved? When God says, talks to me, he always knocks me out of what I think is even thought. Ka ching Well, of course I would. God has conversations with me. You want him to have conversations with your pastors. Can you say amen? You don't want your pastor complete ding-dong. Can you say amen? So I'm sitting there. He says, yeah, see that man over there? You don't know his name? No, don't know his name. Just say, I claim him in Jesus' name. When you do that, you set him right into God's hands. I claim them in Jesus' name, and I bind every evil spirit that's trying to de destroy their life. Second is you bind up the spirits that are destroying, corrupting everybody's life. Everybody has them. Yours are gone, hopefully. <laughs> Periodically, will come back try to harass you. But, so you bind, bind the spirit. When you bind the spirit, in Jesus, all this is done in Jesus' name. The angels come right in and they tie them up. You can just see a couple of angels coming right out and grab that spirit and tie him up. Then he has to go somewhere. You have to tell the spirit or where God where to put him. So don't send him back to hell because hell doesn't keep any evil spirits, just human ones. Okay? You send him past behind the curtain again, or it's called the dry place. So you say, Father, blanket to blank, I claim there for you in Jesus' name every evil spirit that's working against their life to corrupt it, I bind them up now. And I remove, this is the third thing, I remove their assignment to destroy their life. Third thing, I remove their assignment to destroy their life. And I place them behind the curtain where they originally, where you placed them. Or you could say into the dry place. What, got, what happens is the angels walk right over, put them in another dimension where they're shielded from us. So let's say drinking has been a, a prominent thing in your family. That's a familiar spirit that causes people to want to yield to addictive drinking. And you can bind that spirit up, remove this, the assignment, then put it right into that dry place, and that spirit will be removed from your family. 
Remember, your words are very powerful. They're covenant words. That's why if you're a Christian and pray in your mind, stop it. You're boring God. You have to use your mouth. It's a pray say. It doesn't say pray think. Find a place in the Bible where it says silent prayer. It's not in there. I really just used to get really upset because I'd have people sitting in a prayer meeting. I said, you guys pray? Oh, yeah, we prayed. I didn't hear anything. Well, we're not praying to you. Come on, wise up. Words. you got Jesus in your heart with words. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Prayer. See, don't be foolish to listen to the devil's lies. Your thinking isn't all that good. Oh, by the way, thinking, how many of you know that everything comes in your minds from God? This is for Pauline. You could be behind your edge and you could be right where you need to be and an evil thought comes shooting through you. That's the enemy throwing it. Remember that Satan can't read your mind, but he throws suggestions and monitors your perception of it, your reaction to it. So if he calls you a booger and, and somebody calls you a name, don't take it from them. Take it from the one that's inspiring them to call you a name. And bind that spirit up. So we go up, we, we put the person in God's hands. We bind the evil spirits working to destroy their life. We command their assignment removed. We place them in the derived place. Now listen. Then we release their angels. Everyone say release their angels to minister to them. Every one of you has at least two angels from God. You might even have more, okay? And they are there to minister and see and take care of you lest you dash your foot against a stone. The problem is, is angels go on gasoline, not complaining. What I mean by that is, you have to speak the word for angels to hearken you can't be complaining and talking negative and stuff because you'll bind up your angels. They'll just stand there until you're done ranting and raving. Then when you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, and, got, and they're there, ready to go. Lord, I want you to really go visit my child. I've been praying for him. The angels now, their angels start operating. So you have the ability to release people's angels to minister back to them when they had been bombed for a long time. And you want their angels ministering because they'll give them dreams and visions. They'll minister. They'll bring people into their lives. So you want to back the enemy off and bind him up so all they have is God dealing with them. <coughs> Hello? That's how I got saved. Somebody saw me driving down the road with a bong in my hand, a beer. Says, Laura, I claim that man's salvation. You make sure he gets saved, clean him up, and they suck the Holy Ghost on me. Guess what happened? Now, folks, you guys know that I'm a fallen minister, but I've been restored. Every one of you have fallen, too. You're just not a minister. So guess what? Next time you start judging people about falling and getting up, think about your own life. I'm here to help you get up. So you can, you know, get up. It's okay. Get to church. Get these lessons. Follow me on the, the thing. Listen to what God is saying. You'll never get anything quite like this anywhere else. I went out and checked. There's some wonderful teaching out there. But it's not like this. Why do you say that? Because God gave me specifically. I, I sought him and sought him and sought him. Said I need a message for the end times where people are not going to be so squirrely. So, so weird and whacked. And he says, well, you have to get back to what I taught, son. You have to teach what I taught. I taught in such a way everyone received that believed in me. That's where God wants all preaching, centered around Jesus Christ. Say amen. Now, again, I'm not bragging on myself because I went through hell and back at least a dozen times. And, I, and if I told you all the stuff I've experienced... Don't want you to experience what I experienced. I don't want you to go where I have been. I want you to avoid those things. I want you to be able to enjoy. And then we all get to heaven. We all look and rejoice together and say, 
Wow, we worship together. Now we're into heaven together, and we're rejoicing. We need to look up. Stop looking around. It's only a big deception, and it'll only be for a short time, and then we'll be gone. Look up. Say amen. So ask, and you shall what? Seek, and you shall? Here's what a lot of people don't do. They're not seeking for God to show them things. They're just taking whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera, bunch of bunk, you see. Exactly. The enemy wants you totally captivated by what's going on in the earth. Totally captivated. And yet we read, this will pass away. We need to be captivated by our captain of our salvation, the position of our healing. We need to be listening and tuned in to God. And we need to be at places where we're going to learn how to do that. Because there's plenty of people dying every day and going to places they don't want to be. Hello. We need to reach out. When, you, when you're with people and they respect you, don't you leave them without some Jesus. Don't you have a conversation with somebody. You can't leave them with a little thought of Jesus. You don't have to preach at them. Just leave a little Jesus everywhere you go. Stop leaving a little stain and drank all their beer. <laughs> you got to realize that I'm an old hippie. So there isn't anything you can really surprise me with. But you know what? I live for God now. I've never been so free in my life. Hello. But you know what? It was, a, it was not an easy road because I wouldn't listen to him. So my quick journey lasted years. Sounds like the Israelites, huh? 11-day journey through the wilderness, and it took them 40 years. How about you? Will it take your life 40 years, or will you get it now so that you can win other people later on? Are you going to fight and argue with God? No. Now, I'm not preaching at you, see, but a lot of the times where you go to church, you're always getting preached at, so you're liable to think I'm preaching at you too. No, I'm relating to you. You can, choice is right here. How many here would like to start praying for their relatives and see them get saved? I'm, okay, what do we do? We call their name out. We place them in God's hands. Take your hands off of them. They stay there. If conversation, if you have to talk about them, nothing but positive. Oh, I thank God God's working on them. God's doing that. Why? Because by us talking about it, we take it out of God's hands and put it back in ours. You don't want to do that. God's much better at things than I am. Second of all, you bind those spirits so they can't keep coming back. And you remove their assignment, refuse to let them come back, place them behind that curtain. Now, we have an example of that curtain in the temple that rent from top to bottom. That was a curtain of separation. To give us an example, Satan belongs on the other side of the curtain. We belong in the kingdom of God. Say amen. So, seek and you shall find and knock. Satan thinks this planet's his. God has, for some of you, witty ideas. He has ideas for your life, your future, but you got to knock. Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. Lord, I'm going to bug you and bug you and bug you until you show me. Not enough Christians are knocking for the doors to open. And those doors that are shut, Satan doesn't want, to see, want you to see what's behind them. Because what's behind him is greater part of your life. His job is to keep you from a wonderful relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you get that now? So anything that gets in that way is not of God. Everything good, pure, and perfect comes from who? And anything else that doesn't fit comes from either man or something else. Discern everything that comes your way and what you're going to accept and what you're going to say no. You have that authority God has given you. All right, a couple of points. Church, our duty is to bring salvation 
and the, uh, release God's power in the behalf of others. Having a petition, we're to petition our Lord. Okay, so let's look at this. Once we put our loved one in God's hands, behind the curtain, these evil spirits, we've released their angels, then please be careful how you talk about them once you place them there. Say amen. Seriously, once I pray for uh, our country, then I don't sit around and talk with others about all that's wrong with my country. That's just as stupid as a $3 bill. Hello? When you pray for something and you want it to be fixed, how stupid is it for us to leave the presence of God and then talk like it's not fixed? you got to learn a little bit about who you are so that you don't mess up in front of God. Folks, one of our greatest enemies is not the devil. One of our greatest enemies is not the devil. It's us, the flesh. The devil needs your flesh to get all fleshy so he can have fun with you. He's the child molester. He pull you off into yourself and then he plays games with you. The, the only way you can keep from that happening is you've got to be with God. Meet with God, get him to cleanse you every day get it, so that the devil has to stay away. Well, I don't know. Some people think the devil's got a key to their back door, or BJ. None of us. What that is, is he wants you to think that way. He wants you to think that you're covered, but not really covered. He wants you to think that you're blessed, but you're not. You've all got all this. Now I'll keep you double-minded man, and a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways, and he's playing a gamey, gamey, gamey with you because you're not thinking biblically. Say amen. You are not a threat to the devil. God in you is. Let him out. See, when I pray for their sick, I don't heal anybody. I just let God go through my hand, and God heals them. When I laid hands on you, you felt the power. That was God coming over on you, and God rising up in you. All I, does was, I, all I was was a channel. All you are is a channel, direct God, and God will flow. Amen. I preached myself half you guys. All right, so... Another point, and then we'll go on. All prayer is to be done in love. How many know you can't pray curses on people? You know, you pray in it in love. Because if anything is not done in love, it's, not, it's worthless. Hello, it is. If you can't really love somebody, don't tell them you love them. And hope later you can. <laughs> Hello. Everything should be done in love. So if you're going to pray for your loved ones, you pray in love. If you're going to serve somebody, you serve them in love. Can you say amen? Just treat everybody like they're Jesus. They're not. And some of them, you just wish they'd go away. But treat them like Jesus anyway. Because you're selling Jesus. You're giving Jesus. And if you act in the fruit of the Spirit, God will help you to do all of this that I'm saying. This is none of this is on your own. And he helps you with all of that. Then they're going to leave them with Jesus. Don't just wish them a nice day. Say, you know something? God loves you and speak right to their heart. I can send my words right through your body. That's what Jesus does. He goes right to your heart. And, some, and you guys know it. When I preach, you can sense God going... Zzz, 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 zzz. That's the Holy Spirit. You want that to happen. You don't want to go to a church where you... Gosh, I wish the sermon was over. I'm getting hungry. You know what I mean? And another thing, you need more than 20 minutes a week to overcome. You need a good long sermon like this one. I won't keep you for 12 hours, so. All right, let's go on. Okay, third point, prayer inviting God into people's lives. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5. 
Look at verse 14 through 16. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Notice the term in him. Those little words are very important. If I'm outside, am I in here? No, I'm outside. And if I'm in here, am I outside? No. If you're in Christ, where are you? you got to see it. Pictures, the words of God are paint pictures so you have faith to see what really is. When you say Father in Jesus' name, you swoop right into God. No devil in hell is going to look at you at that time. You've got to see how it really is. I, let me encourage you. Watch The Chosen, the series, The Chosen of Jesus. Watch the way Jesus is enacted there. He's just a man, but it's the closest thing I've seen any movie to the way Jesus really is. Well, how do you know, Pastor Kerry? Because Jesus and I walk together. I know what he's like. I know when it's me, and I know it's when it's him. Do you know that? You should, and I believe you would. Can you say amen? Watch it so you can get patterns and see how he responds. Don't go buy a robe and some sandals. Okay. All right. So follow me now. This is the confidence if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So don't ever say, I don't think God's listening to me. That's kind of a dumb thing to say, wouldn't you say? And if we know that he hears us, so you got to know that he's hearing you. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. A petition is a request. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to take care of John. Lord, I place him on your hands in Jesus' name. I bind up every foul thing that's been working on his life, and I place him as in your hands. I bind those spirits, and I remove their assignment. I now put him behind the curtain or into the dry place and forbid them to come back into John's life. Now I take John, and I speak your blessing upon him, that he will, everywhere he goes, he will hear you guiding him. When he chose to choose wrong, you will check him, and you'll begin to guide him. Now I release his angels to carry it out until he comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Now take John, and there he is. That was pretty simple, wasn't it? None of the things God lays out for us is hard. It's hard because our flesh and the enemy doesn't want us to do them. By doing them, we bring freedom to other people. It's the greatest form of love is praying for someone else who might not even not know you at all. So you can see how creative you can be. Lord, I pray for BJ. Now, I know BJ's been having medicines, and she has these things going on in her life. So I bind up every foul spirit from her, and I place her on your altar and in your hands. Lord God, those spirit assignments are removed, including seizures. And Lord God, cause the healing in her mind, all those things that were damaged, to be healed. Now, I place her on your altar and in your hands. Those spirits now have to stay behind the curtain. They're bound eternally, cannot come back. And now I release her angels. Now, you might say, well, BJ's already saved. Yeah, but I just released a bunch of more goodies on her. That's why when somebody says, I bless you, don't say, I am, with a boob. Just so say, I want more. I need more. Look at my life. I got to have help. Right, Michael? Bless you. That's what you got to do. Your father is so in love with you. He sent his only son to get his family back. Now stop playing games and get with the program. Say amen. Come on, you guys are so blessed. Church, our, our duty is to bring others to Christ. That's the first duty. Be with God, bring others to Christ. When we're not bringing others to Christ, we kind of get stale. We get inner focused. We get self-focused. 
we see what's wrong and we need to know what's right. And now our mind has gone off of God onto ourself and what we need, not need, and all that, not, 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 not. Guess what? Stop! Get with God and say, book, I need some help. And God goes, all right. See, it's, it's an art to follow God. It's really a bad deal to say, God, where are you? <laughs> we need to walk with him, and it's not hard at all. In fact, we were told last week, I was shared with you last, we can live and walk in the Spirit every day. Woo, it's glorious. I wish I could spend more time with you. When I first got saved, my pastor did this, and I want to encourage you. He says, it's you and God. That's an adventure. That means God's very creative, and if you're willing to go, he'll take you places you've never been before. When I pray now, God takes me on visions. I've been to your house many times in prayer. I've been to Montana many times in prayer. When people mention the name, for example, your father, Kevin, I was praying for him and saying, boy, it'd be neat to see Kevin shows up. Doesn't really matter, but God wants you to have that wonderful relationship with him. And don't be so concerned about living a life and trying to get it together. That's what the enemy wants us to struggle like. Because under his guidance, there's stress and there's hardships and stuff. I'm not saying all this is going to go away. But you know what? When you're in Jesus and things are going good with Jesus, even if something hard comes your way, you don't look at it the way you used to. You look at it, okay, God, it's got to be you and I. You see? So there's no negatives. You're not looking at your limitations. You know that all things are possible to him that, come on, to him that believes. Jesus said that. Do you believe? Do you really believe? Amen. Now, I'm not doubting you. I'm just trying to have you check yourself. Am I really believing? Am I where I should be? And then don't beat yourself up. You know what's going to happen to some people is when they hear a word like this is really good and they get encouraged, they're going to go out into the parking lot and guess old Slewfoot's going to jump on them and say, yeah, I don't think you could go to that church. You know, this and this, and he'll run a scenario on you. How many remember the first time you came here? The scenarios that came on you, the thoughts and stuff. <laughs> Haven't you figured out his game yet? If the devil tells you not to go here, you better run here. <laughs> and if you got feelings that, you know, you know, whatever the deal is, and they make excuses, you better run here. We have a couple that are fairly new I haven't seen. They better start running here because they need help. Amen. That's why God brought him here. But, you know, we have to remind them. And you know what? We might have to even be a pill. And say, what are you doing? You come to me for help, and then you go out and do it again? <laughs> that stupid gun to seed. That's a parade without any floats. Come on, laugh with me a little. So we, we've got to laugh at each other and see the condition we are in without God. Enjoy God because he loves you with all his heart. Buddy up with them. Make it an adventure with them on a daily basis. I can tell you things, but I mean, ugh, I don't want to tell you now because it sounds like a brag, but I don't want to brag. God will take an average person and blow your mind if you'll let him. He'll take you on things, show you things. We, my cousin and I, used to go on what we call midnight spirit-led meetings. We would get in the car and God would guide us in the spirit. He led us places to plant churches. He actually took us through two gates and made us disappear, go through the gate and come back on the other side. And we're going, what? You know? And so that's why I'm all on fire. Now you say, well, well Pastor Kerry, you had your own life struggles and stuff. What happened? Well, I got out of balance. I got my eyes on everybody else and everything else but God. Everybody falls when you get your eyes on everything else. I don't care if you're a super-duper hot dog of a Christian. 
or not. That's what everybody thought I was. I was the next hero. I never ever thought that. In fact, I never wanted a large church. It was everybody else's idea. I wanted people that really would serve God that we could go out and win souls and touch lives with. Can you say amen? And finishing with you, oh, glory to God. So invite God into their lives. Now, did you get those notes, how I showed you how to do that? Amen. So let's say at the store, somebody's rude to you, Diana. What do you do? You're going to pray for them in the parking lot. Lord, they probably were rude because they can sense you. And they're under conviction, so they're miserable. So I claim their salvation, Lord. I bind up their spirits, and you start claiming them. When any time anybody stands out to you, God makes them stand out so that you can pray for them and claim their salvations. I told you about that one guy at the Kager. Remember, he was cussing and he was screaming and yelling because us Christians were invited in by the bouncer to come in and share Jesus at the Kager. And it was myself, Dennis Randall, Daryl Randall, a whole bunch of us. And so we went to um, what's, uh, Pacific Lutheran's um, uh, cake party there they weren't supposed to have in their fret house. And, of course, they had a bouncer right there in the front. And we walked up to him. He says, it's funny. We don't want to drink. We don't drink. But we want to come in and share Jesus. Is that okay? And he says, he looks at us and he goes, all right. He just let us in. You see, when God's in control of things, Things open up to you. That's why we want to always put him first, always follow what he tries to ask us to do. There was somebody there that needed God. So we went in, we preached and teach. Then we hear this screaming, yelling guy. Ah, oh, but the blank, the blank, you doing it on my cake party? And he was just screaming, cussing. I mean, awful, foul, foul, foul. I just, nowadays I don't like cussing anymore. I used to cuss. But now I just can't just... You know, and I said, God, do something about him. Next thing I know, you hear this big commotion outside. They grabbed him because he was making too much noise, and they threw him out on the lawn. It was his cake party. God knows how to do it, doesn't he? Well, funny thing, the very next day, Life Center was having their, Chris, their singing Christmas tree. Oh, it was beautiful. And then they have an altar call after it. And guess who I saw running up to the altar? Brother Big Mouth. Who do you think you are? Brother Big Mouth. Hey, God got a hold of him. So sometimes when people are reacting towards you, you might be sharing with you, you've already prayed, you already claimed them, they're reacting to you, don't react back. Smile and say, I can see you've got a lot to think about. See ya. <laughs> Why do we always step into their crud and feel like they do. No, stay above, aloof. And, you, and look at them and say, look, I'm here to help you. But I'm not going to crawl into the same garbage you are to get you out of there. Now come out. <laughs> say amen. I'm being a little bit graphic today, aren't I? You're going to have to watch it. All right, last point. Pray, believe, and keep them in God's hands. Mark 11, please. Verse 22 through 26. And finishing with you. You guys say, he, thank God he's finishing. <laughs> so then Jesus answered and he said to them, he had just got through cursing a fig tree. The fig tree represented Israel because Israel was supposed to produce fruits of righteousness. They didn't. Instead, they made everybody be bound. In fact, they were supposed to be preaching the gospel but they preached the law, and God forbid them. So there was no fruit on the fig tree. Now, I have a fig tree. Every year, all year round, there's figs on it with the leaves. They're not ripe, but there's always something you can eat on if you're hungry enough. When Jesus went to that fig tree, all he saw was leaves. There wasn't any fruit. That was a symbol of our lives. You say you're of God, let me see some fruit. Periodically, God will send his angels to you. We've had several visitations, haven't we? Right here at this little church. Angels come right on in. Sometimes you want to ask me about it. 
sat down and ate with us. We didn't know who they were. And then, boof, they were. But we got to realize that God will send people in to test where you're at with him. See if you're going to be kind or not. And will he find just leaves or will he find fruit in your life? Are you just the wavy, wavy, I am praise the praise the Lord, but you're not winning souls, touching lives, and getting people saved? We need to make sure we do that because that's the first great commission. And you go, don't inner think. I can see some of you going, well, I'm not really good at that. Stop thinking. You're probably better at it than you think. Say amen. I'm grandma, and you pray with me now. I'm Grandma. You pray with me now. I'm BJ. You know me. Pray this prayer with me. Don't give them the decision, would you like to pray? Because they're going to opt out. I always say, we're going to pray and get something great. You want it? Yeah. Okay, I'll pray after me. See, I don't give them a chance to run out the back door. Because if I can get the seed in them, even if they're not fully willing... If I can get the seed in them, that seed's going to grow. And our job is to get Jesus in them any way we can. Because otherwise, they're going to hell. And we don't want anyone going there. So you have to almost be sneaky. I had a Catholic lady over here in my podiatrist. You know, you know I only got one leg. So I have, and I have my feet checked because it's supposed to. And a lady came in, and God says, I want you to talk to her. She's Catholic. Went over, her name's Maria. Lift Maria up in your prayers. She received Jesus right there in the office with everybody sitting there. Just, listen, we don't have a lot of time left. Wouldn't you be embarrassed, Pastor Kerry? If you do it right, you don't have to be embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed that Jesus loved me and died for me. Are you? And she gave her heart to the Lord. Right there. The guy that put up our gazebo, fixed the roof finally, his name is Lewis. Lift up Lewis. Lewis, after he's done, come collect his money. I had him. The money in my hand. I said, Lewis, you know, you come from a Catholic background, and your, your grandma and your mom's been praying for you, and you, you could see him tearing up a bit. And I says, listen, God wants you to have him in his heart. You want to do that? Sure. So he prayed and got asked Jesus in his heart. Here's a, here's a millionaire right there sitting here praying with me, holding my hand in our be little place. This is why we live. This is why we're still here. God didn't save us and yank us out of here. It's to touch as many lives as we can. And believe me, then after you do, go right back in and get all that off of you and then just be with God. You see, when you battle, 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 you get battle smell on you. So when you're done battling, cast it off and get a redose of the Holy Ghost. Say amen. Somebody needed to hear that. Okay, so Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. The Greek actually says, have my faith, the faith of God. How many here born again? Raise your hands. Doesn't matter when. Okay. That means God's living in you. He's not left. So you have his faith, too. So you have his, your faith, and you have... I got the hiccups. You have his faith. So which one's more powerful? Which one works more functionally? Well, learn to turn God loose, then, and stop trying to have faith. That's just for you, brother. You have all the faith you need. God has some great plans for you. Amen. We're not doing it in our strength. We're doing it in his strength. We're doing it because he asked us to. Why wouldn't he empower us to do it? I'm never going to ask my children to do something without wanting to be able to help them if they needed that help to do it. Can you say amen? And finishing, glory. He's been finishing for a half an hour. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things 
which he continues to say over and over again. He will have what he continues to say. The woman with the issue of blood says, if I but touch the hem of his garment, if I but touch the hem of his garment, everybody, I want to tell you, I'm going to crawl through there and touch the hem of his garment. When I touch the hem of his garment, I touch the hem of Bingo! How are you talking? Oh, if I could only get to God. If I only have enough faith to get to church. Boo-boo, not bingo. Come on now. I'm trying to be happy with you about those things. You've got a, a wonderful future ahead of you. You have to go to God about where it's going. <laughs> Whew, it's getting, I'm getting really blessed up here and a little lightheaded. So I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so you say be removed, cast in, What is a mountain? Well, if you're riding a donkey or you're walking, a mountain is an obstacle, wouldn't you say? Now, I want to tell you something. Jesus is never in a hurry. Say, Jesus is never in a hurry. He only operates at three miles an hour. He walked everywhere. He never ran anywhere. He never was in a hurry. He never was late. Always pre-planned, always together, because he goes to his father and talks to him. So everybody thought Jesus was Jesus, and he couldn't do no wrong because he's Jesus. Oh, he could have done any kind of wrong. It would have disqualified him. you got to read your Bible, find out. He could have sinned just like any of us. But he prayed to God, his Father, every day for instructions and insight. How about you? You want to have a better life? Get in step with God. Be removed, be cast into the sea. So let's look at another obstacle. Do you have children that still need to be saved? Now you know what to do with them. Do they have spirits in their life that are hindering them from coming and receiving Jesus? They command those mountains be removed. Can you say amen? amen. So they can get from A and from B and come right and receive Jesus. Say amen. Then he goes on further to say, but you have to believe in your heart, not doubt. Then he says, whoever should say to this mountain, therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them here and now. You got them. This is mine. Well, I don't see any physical evidence. Doesn't matter. I got the title deed. I remember before Linda and I got married, she said to me, in my other church, we, we bought a, a freezer, a giant freezer for the food bank. And I told everybody in the congregation, we got a giant freezer, everybody, and everybody goes, oh, that's great, wonderful, yay. But Linda, now she's my wife, said to me, where is it? And I said, see this little receipt here? It hasn't shown up physically, but I'm holding the title deed. You're holding the title deed. His name is Jesus, and he has your life in his hands. You want to see how it's going to really turn out, or do you want to continue guessing and playing gamby gambily? You're pulling the one-armed bandit trying to live your life instead of going to Jesus and let him live it through you. Say Amen. You have the title lead in your heart. If you let him run your show, your life, he will make sure you get everything he first planned and properly desired for you as a human being. God's plans for you are good. And they're wonderful. The other stuff is not from God. It's a mixture. You're supposed to be able to see the difference. And make the choices with God's help. Say amen. And finally, boy, he's done. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, for this reason I also suffer these things. I'm being persecuted to teach you guys. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know that I have what I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to God. 
folks, did you give your children to the Lord? Did you give your relatives or your sisters, your brothers to the Lord? Have you given your family to the Lord? Have you some friends that you love that you want to see saved? Place them on God's altar in his hands. Bind up the spirits. Cause them to go away and never come back. Release their angels and then place them on the altar in Jesus' name and leave them there. And then, when they come up in conversation, make sure you don't say anything against your prayer. The Bible says, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink? Okay? It says, take thought to God and say, God will make care of those needs. So we have, a, we have this terrible thing called the abundance of our heart, our mouth slippeth. Hello? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. If we're not careful, we'll talk about the things we shouldn't and not say anything about the things we should. Isn't that strange? Huh? And why do we explain life and death? It's just killing me. Tickles me to death. I'll be dying if I do. I'll be killing me. Boy, you're killing me. How about those expressions though? somehow leaked into people's conversations? You see, we have to strain out What's bull and what is good? Can you say amen? And in order to do that, you need Jesus forefront in your life. Did you get something out of that this morning? Would you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen.